Hello. Before we begin, uh, just a reminder, in case it's not obvious, that the views expressed by Matt are his and his alone. Um, and less expressly stated, they don't. Um, they're not similar to the views of either Tabletop Gaming Magazine or that of the Warner's Group of Publishing. Uh, that's just legally bit out of the way. Um, and secondly, um, listen, a big thank you to all of you who continue to actually download, listen, subscribe and rate and review us. Um, just a big thank you for helping us kind of reach where we are. Um, we've got some really exciting things coming up and it wouldn't be possible without you you kind of listening right now. So thank you. And uh, I hope you enjoy this uh, this very, very fun-to-do episode with Matt Jarvis from Tabletop Gaming Magazine. But now, on with the show. Welcome to We're Not Wizards. My name is Richard. I will be your host for this evening. And joining me this evening is a gentleman who we spoke to a little while ago. And he was taking his first steps into the being the editor of Tabletop Gaming Magazine. It is the one, the only, the recently birthdayed boy, Mr. Matt Jarvis. So good evening to you, sir. Good evening, Richard. How's it going? It's it's very very good. It's very very good. It's hot. Um, yeah, I'm a good nine and a half this evening. I mean that kind of <laughs> happens. That kind of happens now and again. But yeah, I must admit, um, it has been. Um, it's been a busy old year for you. I'm guessing Definitely so far. Has, thank you, thank you for telling everyone that it's been my birthday recently. I appreciate that you're letting everyone know <laughs> that I am in fact getting older and not ageless. Listen, if we could compare ages right now, I'm probably still old enough to be your dad. So let's <laughs> let's kind of get that let's kind of get that out, out of the way, you know. Um, yeah, I was kind of born in the seventies. I'm pretty sure you were born well after that. So I won't even name a year. I'd rather st- keep stay, it uh, stay in <laughs> yes. the as far as age is concerned. Um, but yeah, so last time we spoke, you hadn't long kind of taken over the the role um, as editor of tabletop gaming magazine that's right um, i think i was a couple a couple of weeks in if that <laughs> yeah. and then i was thrown onto the podcast and was sort of like oh ah. i've got to do this professionally now rather than just being someone who likes to play games a lot yeah. now i have to talk about them and people will hear and go that guy sounds <laughs> you know questionable well i've been blagging it now for about 18 months and i seem to be getting away with it <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know, I've just, you know, I've just, yes, I've definitely played Settlers of Catan. Board game? What's a board game? Um, <laughs> um, well, I guess we should say that for anybody who, um, who hasn't listened to the show before, thank you for coming on, whether you found us through the wonders of iTunes. And a quick mention to those who have actually gone on and subscribed and rated and reviewed us. Thank you very, very much. Um, the reason that we do this, and Matt's heard this all before, and we're still running with the same joke, is that we believe there's quite simply not enough podcasts out there about board games. And the second reason that we do this is because sometimes we get people on, and we have them back on to find out what they've been up to, what they've been playing, and how in general life is treating them. So, Mr. Matt Jarvis, tonight you're officially now a repeat offender. Now, how do you That's feel about right. How do you feel about that? I feel like there could be a better title for it, but I'll accept it. I'll, I'll roll with it. I probably won't put it on my CV. No. Don't take any offence when it's That's you don't fine. see it popping up there. That's fine. That's fine. I don't expect any kind of mention anywhere else. You know, recently I was a repeat offender. <laughs> That'll on... be the, uh, I'll change my title in the magazine from editor to repeat offender and see uh, how many copies we shift then. <laughs> How many? How long it is before you get a quiet, a quiet little email saying, um, yeah, if you wouldn't mind uh, 
kind of coming up into the senior manager's office. <laughs> <laughs> but um, as we said, Gen Con's been around. Um, very quickly, was there anything that kind of tickled your fancy that you saw or you heard about? Uh, well, it's been a an interesting one, really. I think actually for me the the biggest thing was actually just before Gen Con. I don't think it technically counted as Gen Con, which was Twilight Imperium Fourth uh, Edition. Yeah, which I think Fancy Flight dropped maybe the week before Gen Con or right at the beginning, and then obviously they in Gen Con Fancy Flight then dropped Star Wars Legion, which <laughs> sort of was a big old sort of surprise. But also as someone who who likes miniatures or is trying to get back into miniatures, I suppose I should say, was yeah. sort of one of those things where I started to go, ah, you know, I guess I should save some money for this. I mean, yeah. they there sure are a lot of Star Wars games out of Fantasy Flight now, but they continue to be very good. And those miniatures sure look really nice. They look... That, that actual noise, that involuntary noise that I apologise profusely for cutting across you was actually not me, it was my wallet. Um, <laughs> kind of in shock because, um, yeah, miniatures. Yeah, I mean, it's a is it a bold move? Is it a brave move in your opinion, or is it just something? It's just something different, isn't it? It's another thing to add to the stable. Well, it's. I think it's an interesting one because they they obviously had X Wing now for a long time, and X Wing is a proven money spinner. But X Wing is a very different kind of game. It's not aimed at the miniatures crowd no. you have you know the ships come pre-painted it's very quick it's very snappy you have quite a few you have not that many even um miniatures on the table yeah um and then obviously they they experimented with room wars earlier this year that i i enjoyed the gameplay of because it was just x-wingy enough to mm. be quite snappy and so on but i didn't particularly get behind the lore of the rune bound universe it just didn't capture me at all i just found it quite generic as far as fantasy goes and i i think that that was just i don't know it was a very mixed bag and i don't know how how it's fared i'd be quite interested to know um sort of the wider reception to it um but i think this is a this makes sense in terms of putting star wars into miniatures it's it's perhaps one of the best things to take on you know the new warhammer yeah. 40,000 with yeah. because there's few universes out there for outside of gameplay because there's obviously infinity and things like that but in terms of universes there's few things that can take on Warhammer for sci-fi on the tabletop like Star Wars well it's the world building isn't it I mean you're the, only, exactly. the only other contender I guess <clears throat> would be cool mini or not's kind of fire and ice um, kickstarter mm, um, and even that it didn't do that yeah. big compared to mm. when you look at a lot of come on's other stuff i mean rising sun did several million yes. i think ice and fire crept over the million mark maybe i haven't to be yeah. honest i haven't checked um since i think it's finished now um but c- considering that it's essentially game of thrones and i don't know whether that played into it maybe because it was branded as song of fire uh, ice and fire instead of game of thrones perhaps people just weren't as fussed because they wanted those characters from the tv show they weren't necessarily as fussed about seeing you know artists renditions of folks from the books maybe that you'd prefer you know a small sort of miniature peter dinklage rather than you know someone's impression yeah of Tyrion. yeah i think that's maybe i don't know i kind of looking at it because i as i do i'm one of these annoying people i chuck in a buck as they would say it's almost like a section of the show you kind of what would be chucking the buck in this week but yeah, it did like one. It did one point seven, so it didn't do too badly. But compared to uh, other Simon well, stuff, I think it really rallied towards the end. But I think I, can... I was going to say it definitely shot up when I looked at it. it was a, it was about seven hundred thousand? I think maybe yeah. the last time I looked at it. So it, it sounds like it shot up quite a bit. But even even so, like you say, you know they they're used to several multi millions, and to get to gather less than two is especially with something as big as potentially as big as Ice and Fire, Game of Thrones. Yeah, you just expect that it would be much higher yeah but i guess it's the kind of the world it's it's the world building stuff because let's face it game of thrones isn't about the big armies fighting each other i mean a lord of the rings miniature game big armies fighting each other that's acceptable dark imperium big armies fighting ex- each other that's perfectly acceptable but let's face it star wars as far as i mean 
in my opinion, and this is in my opinion, and when you are building a game like a, a kind of a, any kind of wargaming game, if the, the, one of the most difficult things is to build up the world, and it can take a long time to build up the world, I mean, let's face it, if you're just dropping Star Wars miniatures on the table, everybody knows, you, you drop like a, you know, a biker scout and his little, um, his little um, kind of bike thing from Endor. Everybody knows what that is. If you drop a, you know, an Atat on there, everybody knows what that is, kind of thing. If you drop Vader or Luke, everybody knows the kind of the backstory. So the world's kind of there. It is kind of like to, and you're probably too young for this, but I remember distinctly playing war games with the original Star Wars figures when they came out in the early eighties. So it was just like bigger versions of that, and you would line all the guys up, and you would sit them. You would actually stand them on the floor, and you would have the big machines facing off each other. So this was kind of like this really, really hits a serious nostalgia vein for me. I mean, there is a little bell of joy kind of ringing away when I heard this was coming out. So hmm. we just have to see kind of how it plays. I do wonder about the the fact it's not painted though, because a big draw of X Wing is because that a lot of the star wars crowd are the kinds of people who don't necessarily have time to paint a lot of miniatures mm. you know it's very it's it's quite expensive and i'm sure legion would be sort of prohibitively expensive yeah. if those models were painted i imagine that's a big part of why they're not yeah. but it it's such a bigger draw i mean even for me i i collected warhammer as a kid i was very much into painting and i enjoy painting miniatures but i just don't know if i would have the time to, to put into painting I think it, maybe it helps that it's a skirmish game there are fewer figures than yeah. something a yeah. rank and file game like Rune Wars or, or even Warhammer I mean I think the expectation is you have quite quite you know a much smaller selection and because they're Star Wars figures I mean Stormtroopers you can just spray them white essentially <laughs> spray them white and do a quick wash and you're done <laughs> I know that was it I mean be Darth like... Vader spraying black you know it's... Exactly. it'd be like the uh, minions and mechs versus minions I thought like you... you were talking about minions from Despicable Me. I was like, well, I guess you can just spray them yellow. <laughs> you just stick them in the middle of the field and all you hear is, banana. <laughs> it's kind of terrifying to consider a, a miniatures game that involves minions from Despicable Me. I think, sort of being oh my goodness, mixed that in with Warha- to the Warhammer universe. Sort of the grim dark universe of Warhammer meets the happy go lucky oh, slapstick amazing com- that comedy be, of the minions as they're I, torn apart. That has to ha- somebody has to do that now. I mean, that does have to ha- Can you just imagine you kind of like, what are you doing? I have got think my. I want to imagine. <laughs> I've got my fifteen hundred pointers. What are you bringing on? Well, I've got my legions here. I've got my librarians. What are you bringing? I've got Stan, Larry, Barry, Paul, <laughs> <laughs> and what's that? That's the big banana attack. Banana kind of thing. Oh, that'd be somebody out there if you're listening to this. But the minions game has to happen, pretty much. But um, yeah, we'll see. I mean, I'm interested to see what they do with the rule set. Because if they're going to go for something quite complicated or if they're going to be looking for something that anybody can kind of jump in on. It which... sounds like it's quite quick in yeah. terms of the the way the movement works, that you move a, a leader and then you sort of dot your the rest of the squad around them so you're not measuring each and every model. It sounds mm. quite loose, which was... it, And it's also quite different. It's interesting they've gone with something very different to Room Wars, which was obviously X-Wing. Yeah. And then... But I suppose using then the X-Wing gameplay for another Star Wars game maybe isn't the way to go because if you've got exactly the same gameplay but slightly different models, there's no real draw there for a different crowd. It's yeah. people who would already have X-Wing collections not fussed about just buying a load of other models that they then have to paint themselves. Yeah. But it sounds it does sound interesting. I was really impressed with the new Warhammer. It, it was one of those things where yeah. I, yeah. Having, I played a few matches of it and thought, oh, I could actually get back into this. <laughs> this is really drawing me back in. And it's been a really good sort of year for miniatures in general. You're seeing these really interesting takes on the, the formula from these big companies, companies that aren't necessarily or hadn't been necessarily involved in that style of miniatures game before, really, even, even with X-Wing. It's sort of a, a different style. Yeah, but I mean, the guys that, I mean, if you get somebody committed to the war game and stuff, let's face it, okay, if I go out and buy, if I really like Scythe, yeah, Mm. I can buy the two or three expansions and that's it. If I really like Star Wars Legion, I'm going to keep on buying, you know, stuff after stuff after stuff. And then there is going to probably be 
the official Fantasy Flight paint set on how you paint your miniatures kind of thing. There's going to be additional expansions, potential rule books, additional campaigns. So it could be a nice little kind of money, additional money spinner. And as you well, and if not taking the lazy route of just remaking Rune Wars and sticking Star Wars on it, then people are going to maybe take a little bit more notice and not just sit there and say, back, they just reskinned it and stuck it out there. Why should I bother? Mm. Kind of thing. And um, what do you think about that? I mean, is the X Wing scene still as strong? I mean, I've seen the next wave of ships for that, and to be honest, I was kind of like going, I have really don't recognise any of the ships. I think the, the, the scene is it's certainly the competitive scene definitely seems to still be thriving. Yeah, I mean, at UK Games Expo there was the the European Championships of Fantasy Flight, and when I walked through the hall each time, it was absolutely packed out. Mm. I think you're right in the the ships. Obviously, you hit a certain point where the Star Wars universe has so many recognisable ships. But for people who are really invested in that universe, the stuff from the Clone Wars series Mm. and obviously from Rogue One, Force Awakens. And now that you've got a film out every year, you know, there is a certain amount of new ships to to bring in. Maybe not as recognisable, but if you're invested in that game anyway, I guess at some point it becomes, you know, it doesn't matter as much what the ships look like. It's more about the gameplay once you're hooked by... The initial mm. Star Wars of it. That's why you, you know, that's why yeah. you get X Wings and Tie Fighters in the core set. Mm. But then you move on to other stuff once you've learned that gameplay and once you're looking for something different. But yeah, it, it is an interesting one. I think maybe, maybe I'm wrong with this. I, to be honest, I'm not uh, a super close follower of the Fancy Flight stuff. But they, Fancy Flight is notorious for putting out expansions. You know, obviously with the Living Card Game stuff. I really like Arkham Horror the Card Game, for instance, but it is impossible at some point for me to keep up. <laughs> yeah. As, as much as I like it, just yeah. because it's a relentless... You well, know, look at Imperial Mythos Assault. Packs, you've got expansions. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Imperial Assault is the same. I mean, I have often... I've got Imperial Assault, um, which um, I kind of... I'm, to my shame, and I spoke with Andy Lewis from Polyhedron Collider about this, I haven't played it, and it's sat there for... Oh, really? Yeah, I just, I just haven't, but then I've... There'll be a time where I will be browsing through kind of um, a couple of um, kind of um, retail sites and just be going, oh yeah, this is, yeah, let's have a look and stick it, stick Imperial Assault into like, you know, Chaos Cards or something. And then just amazed at the number of various expansions, mini boxes, medium boxes, blister packs, kind of everything that you can get. And it just kind of, it kind of puts me off. I think a little bit, but we'll, yeah, we'll, we'll see. We'll see. It's kind mm. of interesting to kind of, it'll be interesting to kind of see what, um, see what happens. Was there, um, anything else that you kind of thought, oh, hello, can't wait until we potentially have a look at this further on at, at Tabletop Magazine? Well, I was actually quite lucky to, to have a few things. I think that we're either launching at Gen Con or sort of being sure enough at Gen Con come in, uh, Ooh. for the next magazine. So, Unearth, the next game from, Brotherwise, who did Boss Monster, yes, uh, is sort of a, a dice roller, dice placement game. And I played Boss Monster, and as someone who likes video games, enjoyed the idea of it. And, yeah, yeah. But nece- wasn't didn't necessarily stick with the gameplay. The gameplay was it was interesting enough, but it it was quite straightforward. It you know it it sort of lost me after a little while. But I don't know if I've been really really enjoying. I mean, it's it's dice, so it's all down to to luck at some point, and that can affect how the game flows quite a bit. Oh. But I think they introduce enough interesting sort of decisions and and options where a lot of the luck side of it is negated, or at least there's some flexibility in terms of oh, I rolled, uh, I rolled low, so I can pick up a stone and sort of create these wonders, or I can roll high and try and take, you know the. Uh, the main ruins mm, from okay. the center so they do some really interesting stuff and it looks it looks incredible i mean it, it looks like monument valley the the ios game oh right almost okay. down to a t and right. having spoken to them i think they said that they they obviously came up with the art style independently but there's definitely that influence <laughs> of isometric <laughs> phone games there's yeah. i mean it's undeniable at some point I, I, you look at boss monster and that was 8-bit and 16-bit yeah i mean games. it was like like the, the box looked like a nintendo packet i mean you could exactly you, you know i mean that kind of like well i kind of got into it kind of accidentally i was sitting there playing my brother's old nintendo <laughs> looked at a um, box and i got the inspiration but no i'm looking at the um 
I mean, as I'm looking at the box art just now, and yeah, <laughs> you kind of, mm, you know, you say tomato, I say tomato. You know, we're not uninsinuating, but it does look very, very similar, mm. similar to what you see in Monument Value Valley. But it is, um, it's not that um, expensive. It's... No, it's and it's a really nice set. I mean, it comes. I, this is a sort of a personal love of mine, but it comes with a dice bag, which is or a bag for the tokens even. But it yeah. comes with a, a sort of branded stitch logo dice bag, which is always something. Speaking of Arkham Horror, the card game, mm. one big thing that that game was missing was a bag for the tokens that you draw out uh, when having tests and doing combat and so on. Which we ended up using a Bananagrams bag, I think, in the end. <laughs> but you know. It's just one of those things where it's a little touch. It's just it that little extra, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And the cards are all, I think the ruins, the main ruins are sort of these big tarot card style uh-huh. shapes. And then the Delver cards are small X-Wing style small cards. Um, and then the Wonders are almost a normal playing card size. And so you've got this difference of sizes. You've got these nice, uh, you get a different selection of dice for each person, I think. You get a D4, um, maybe 1D8, and then 3D6s, something along those lines. It's just a good-looking game, and it plays really well. It's not the, not the deepest game in the world. It's not gonna, yeah, you know, it's not gonna keep you hooked for hours and hours and hours. But we've been, we keep going back to it, and it plays pretty snappily. You can play it in about half an hour or so, yeah. And it and it's just a fun, it's just a real fun game to to enjoy. Yeah, sometimes you just need that. You need that half hour kind of nice little snappy game that you can just stick down in front of the table and have a quiet, quick kind of playthrough. We don't need yeah, to Yeah, and be, this is becoming yeah. that for us. Yeah. Did you... Um, the other one that's kind of caught my interest in a related kind of level is Dice Forge, which seems to yes, have come I love from Dice nowhere. Forge. It's come it's from nowhere. It's brilliant. It's a great little game. It's re- uh, Speaking of good-looking games, Dice yeah. Forge really looks the business. Yeah. And it's another one that, you know... Um, what? Because when somebody was saying, "All right, okay, have you?" I'm trying to think who it was. I think it was maybe somebody posted on. I think it was Board Game Spotlight, James Hudson's group, and they says, "Oh, here's Dice Forge. Ha ha! Look at this. The artwork. Speaking of borrowing or being influenced by artwork, it looks like the artwork from the Dark Crystal, the Jim Henson uh, movie. Yes. Yeah, the the cover art is very yeah. Dark Crystal-y. Yeah. So um, there was actually, I think it might have been on Board Game Geek. There was a really good. Uh, designer's diary or something from the artist um, or maybe it was on the Dice Forge site itself um, but it was going through how they came up with the the artwork for the cover it was quite interesting just to see the the process of I think they went through something that looked very different um, and then eventually ended up with the crystal design but it was just this really interesting look behind the scenes of you don't necessarily think about how board game art is sort of constructed not just through the process of painting it, but the way it's designed to entice people to give certain aspects of the gameplay to get that all across, but in a picture. It just looks really nice. It looks the kind of like mm. a it's nice and a, sort of like a bright breezy kind of game. The only thing the only thing I've heard, of, I mean, again, it's like what thirty odd quid or something. So it's something else that's maybe not going to ridiculously break the bank. But um, do you really did you really really kind of enjoy it? Do you really like it? Yes, yeah, it's a great. Again, it's it's not the deepest thing in the world, mm. but it's there's a real satisfying sort of just loop to it mm-hmm. where you're obviously upgrading your dice. Some of the the dice stuff is a little finicky, sort of getting yeah. the panels off. Yeah. The dice, I think, there's they're obviously constructed in a way that where it's best to get the faces off and so on. But there's something about them that I'm that isn't quite completely up my street. I think it's the rounded corners and things like that. They mm. feel a little. I don't know, almost a little gimmicky, but the actual gameplay and the way it looks is fantastic. And there's a just a good, satisfying build-up of... Um, it's been a little while since I played it, I'm trying to remember. Um, <laughs> but you build up, I think it's Moon moon and Sun. I can't remember what they're referred to in game as. Yeah. Um, but you can either sort of build up those and get upgrades, or you can invest in in faces. So you can get powers from one board mm-hmm. um, in the shape of cards and so on that introduce new and some of them introduce completely new mechanics so you can expand the amount of cubes you can hold for certain resources and things like that or you can just upgrade your faces so there's this good split of trying to progress things forward or almost investing in better die faces which obviously then you you pick which die they go on and yeah there's it's it is very straightforward but there's this real interesting 
just hook to it and it and it looks really nice they use the the actual box which is something you don't often see uh in a really interesting way where you place the tray of die faces on top of the box and uh, the main box is decorated to look like a, a Greek temple or an ancient temple. Yeah, I've seen and that. And there's yeah. a separate board that extends and is meant to be placed next to it. So it, it comes all together into this sort of this really great looking, just like I guess landscape on the tabletop, and all the cards that slot into the edges continue the artwork. It's just a really, it's That's a really good looking game. It yeah. plays really well, and it's it's really straightforward. It's the kind of thing I could introduce to my parents. Or something like that, but it is a just a cracking little game in itself. I mean, it's again, it's 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 just like stop being so many board games, stop being so <laughs> many good, please. Um, I mean, I had an interesting day because I um I spoke to um Frank West, friend of the show, and all right, all round nice guy. At least until I thought he was an all-round nice guy because he says, oh, look, here's a list of all the games that I played at Gen Con. <laughs> so he says he sent me his board game geek list of everything that he played and kind of Dice Forge was on there. Um, he also came back with um, The Dead of Winter Flick Em Up. Oh, know. yes, yeah. And um, I'm just really intrigued to hear what they would do with that kind of IP, how they've kind of made it cartoon cartoonized I guess is that and that's not even a word um, <laughs> if they've done that but kind of maintain the kind of the dead of winter theme I don't know if you've had if you've if that's something you've looked at or seen I know they were selling it at Gen Con I know that um, um, I know there was a big um, there was a big noise made about that um, at the time that it was actually going on sale at Gen Con it's definitely something I'm keeping my eye on I mean it's just interesting I, I'm a big fan of dead of winter again I just think it's a yeah, I introduced it to a friend who's not very into board games, and he he was sort of hooked. And so, you know, years after playing it originally, this had been a while since I'd I'd played it, and you know, it was quite easy to get back into it. It's a very satisfying game because uh, of the crossroads stuff and because of the way the the dice are implemented. But it's not something you often see where board games are crossed with each other in this way, and it's just interesting to wonder what could come next i suppose and like you say it's not it's not necessarily an obvious combination flick em up which no, is a dexterity no. game that's quite cartoony spaghetti western and then dead of winter you know not not a complicated game but probably more complicated than flick em up with that involves dice rolling and more of a storytelling element and it's they're quite to dark. mash them up is yeah. yeah it's it's you know you wouldn't necessarily think of it but i'm i'm really intrigued to see i guess how it plays and and what what myself and what other people think of it and whether that's something we can expect more of as as board games continue to grow and sort of as you know these universes continue to be there to to grow in the way that they are and to, to become you know their own entities like like runebound like fancy flights pushing runebound yeah you know we don't often see board games in the same way that something like video games or films you don't often know characters from board games because the players are the characters in a lot of ways. Dead of Winter is actually an exception where you have, you know, named characters like yeah. Sparky the dog and so yeah. on and people seem to know that. I mean there's a comic book of Dead of Winter. Yeah. And so if there's if there can be a comic book, what else could there be? You know, could we see a Dead of Winter film or would that just be Dawn of the Dead, but snowy? <laughs> it would be the sad version of Shaun of the Dead. <laughs> where everybody was just like really sad. Because that's what seems to happen. It's like, oh you found a birthday birthday card and a birthday cake oh it was rotten and full of rats and the rats ate your eyeballs and it's like thanks thanks john gilmore for bringing that joy into my life i'm just interested to see how it plays if Mm. you i'd be guessing and this is a total guess is that there's the whole kind of when you're playing you always roll for exposure and i'm wondering if you still get the pieces of the map are out there to visit the things and you've got to flick to reach the places and if you flick too much or too little, and if you don't land, you end up in the the kind of outside and potentially could end up getting bitten. I mean, it's one of these, it kind of opens your eyes to kind of like the, the kind of like the possibilities, which is kind mm, of... I definitely hope it's that more than just, oh, it's a, you know, it's flick them up, but with zombies instead of yeah. cowboys. And you, you have a couple of characters. Yeah. Because what that would just feel like a waste, but... 
So you've been playing much yourself. I mean, we had yeah. a quick chat in the green room, and you said, actually, I have been able to play some stuff. So what you've been playing yourself then? So yeah, I've actually I've gone back to quite a few games recently. Uh, one of the ones I'm particularly enjoying at the moment, uh, which I've been through for review and sort of keep going back to, is is Deadline, mm-hmm. uh, which is I think it's a Wiz Wiz Kids game. I can't remember the designer, um, but it's it's a in a really interesting comment. It's sort of like Sherlock Holmes consulting detective, or I suppose it's even closer to Watson and Holmes. I don't know if you played that the recent sort of spin off of that that was yeah, more of a au- auction and bidding game uh with the the mystery sort of condensed onto cards. Mm-hmm. I've heard I've heard a lot about that. I've heard people kind of uh, very praiseworthy of that. Mm, it's it's a fantastic game. But this is this does a similar thing and it's not Victorian murder mysteries or Jack the Ripper or anything like that. It's sort of a pulpy nineteen thirties New York um setting and you play as detectives working together. Oh. But there's a it's got a card game mechanic that drives the mysteries. So you're you choose a, a location, and each location has a certain combination of it's it's very sort of film uh, film noir and sort of you know Ray Bradbury, yeah. all of those sort of authors. It's kind of like so your it condenses pulpy it down type to, book kind of thing. Exactly, it is, yeah. it's pulp as it comes. The cover is a a magazine like a yeah. pulpy magazine yeah, totally. sort of artwork. Yeah. Yeah. But the symbols you're trying to match on these cards that you're playing down are there's like a gun there's a whiskey shot glass there's cigarettes it's you know it's the pulp things you think of it's all the cliches but it leans into it in a way that really works it's i think i haven't actually played the grizzled Mm -hmm. um that card card game but i understand it's similar to that where you're you're placing them down and they have to overlap in a certain way for them for your cards to be allowed to be placed down Mm -hmm. and once you get a certain combination for each area you can then read the bit of narrative on the back all right okay and so the idea is you go through these cards you and they unlock different you know different locations different people to talk to and then at the end you have this consulting detective style series of questions where you then have to look at all the the clues you've gathered look at all the evidence and try and work out the main mystery so the card game bit doesn't necessarily play into the actual solving of the mystery beyond just stopping you going to all these locations you know off the bat yeah but it, yeah it's it's a really interesting thing it's the writing is it's very pulpy it's it hits all the cliches you know it's it's nothing revolutionary in terms of the way it's written and the card game bit isn't super complicated it's it's quite you know, it's very similar with each case. There, are, I think there are twelve different cases that each have specific locations and outcomes and so on. But it's it's just again, it's just a really good game. We keep sitting down with it for it plays in about forty five minutes, so it plays a lot quicker than a lot of the consulting detective cases, mm-hmm. which can stretch on and stretch on. And you also get powers for your detectives. Um, you sort of get a once per game power. All right, okay. Um, and things like that. And if you run out of cards or you can't go, you can end up playing plot twists, uh, which are sort of ongoing effects that can be good, can be bad, uh, and things like that. But it's a really, just a really interesting mashup. And it's it's just fun. You know, the mysteries aren't particularly complicated. They're nothing near consulting detective levels. And that, in many ways, that's often a good thing because you don't, get the same leaps in logic uh, in most of them that you do in Console Detective where you're like, well, we thought it was this guy and actually it was this cat yeah. that happened to run past and yeah. knock this thing over and yeah. stuff like that. It's, it was this you know, hot dog and it's like, hang exactly, on. yeah. Did have hot dogs in Victorian England? What are you talking about? <laughs> but, but you'll yeah. probably, you'll solve the mysteries with not that much difficulty. It's very hard to miss a lot of the clues. All right, okay. Uh, there are there are ways to miss them if you fail enough of the the clue cards, but it's, you know, it's it never gets particularly tough. And you you know if you've missed a clue, so you can normally work out what you're missing. Mm. But it's it's just quite a satisfying game to play. It's It's sort of like sitting down to watch you know, 45 minute TV program, one of those, you know, BBC sort of crime dramas and so on. You sort of know where it's going, you know, yeah. you know how the people will speak, you know who did it when they appear on screen, but <laughs> exactly. it's still fun to sit down and work it out and go through the, the motions. Yeah. So yeah. I've been really, really enjoying that. Cool. Cool. I mean, is that, is that another one that's about 30 odd quid then? So, I mean, there seem to be... Uh, I'd imagine so. There's not a lot in the box. It's, it's largely cards. The cards uh-huh. aren't, you know they they're relatively thin 
and things like that. So I, I don't quote me on it, but I'd imagine it's about 30, 30 or 40 pounds. I'd be oh, very surprised if it was more than that. Ach, we'll find it. I mean, we'll, we'll, um, we'll, we shall track it down and we shall make sure we bring it to the ground and then we shall stick it in the, stick it in the show notes so people can all, all kind of find it. Um, is there anything, it sounds like a bit of a theme that you kind of hanging on to the games that you can kind of get through in about 30, 40 minutes? I definitely, yeah. I do like to play longer stuff. Uh, mm. With reviews, obviously, it's it's often nice to have the shorter stuff to go back to in between as palate cleansers, like Sushi Goes become a favourite yeah. between reviews just to, to break things up. And recently we've been playing a lot of Medici, the card game. Uh-huh. Uh, the Rainer Knizia, obviously, sort of, I think, 90s classic, one of his auction games that was then condensed down into a card game. They sort of stri- stripped out the, the auction ness of it uh and just made it this uh it's more of a press your luck you draw a certain amount of cards and you're trying to put these resources onto your boat you have a limited amount of space and then you you stick them in a warehouse Mm -hmm. and they're worth different values and so on but that's been i mean i haven't actually played the original medici i'll admit that up front but i've been really really enjoying the card game version of it uh and then Oh, weirdly enough, uh, we played Knizia's Modern Art, which is again right, okay. an entry in the the hallowed sort of auction trilogy. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think I think it was actually come on just put out a new version of it, a new edition um, that overdoes the artwork with actual artwork from real artists, and that's that's a really excellent that's little game nice, yeah. uh, where you're you're bidding on this art, and everybody's money values are hidden. Um, but you can push up the value of certain artists if more of their works are brought. Mm-hmm. Um, so you can end up sort of playing the market in your favor because there are different types of auctions for each card. So you can bundle certain paintings together by the same artist and that would obviously force their value to increase. Or you can do open auctions where you go until everyone else drops out or you can do uh, hidden auctions where people put the money in their hand and reveal it all at once or single bid auctions there's just a really good variety and you go through these different rounds and the the artists build up values depending on where they place uh how many of their paintings are sold during each round mm-hmm. it's a really a really solid uh little auction game and it's the presentation in the new edition is just fantastic like the screens that each player has to hide their money are uh, sort of styled on different galleries so there's you know like paris modern Uh uh sort of the new york uh gallery i assume that i don't think they're real places but there's a good variety in there yeah that's been that's been really good as we said at the top of the show you've been kind of doing the editing for almost a year now with there seems to be more and more board games kind of kicking about or either that or there seems to be more exposure to them have are you finding it as an editor? Is it easier to fill up a magazine in terms of the amount of games you can cover, or is it more difficult because you have to be kind of picking, choosy about what you are going to cover? Um, in terms of like, I mean, I suppose even like things like the new hotness and stuff like that. I mean, is that is is it major? Is your job being made easier, kind of like that, or are you kind of like, oh, I don't know, do I do this or do I do something else, kind of thing? It's definitely both. I, I mean, it's especially with board games because they're so varied. Mm. You you obviously have certain designers, certain publishers that you follow. I mean, Fantasy Flight. A lot of the Fantasy Flight stuff is going to be big releases. You know, mm. they are the biggest company in board games. So you'll follow that stuff. You'll try and speak to those designers. But then there'll be stuff that comes completely out of nowhere. First time designers or first time publishers. That's really really excellent stuff and you obviously want to be on that as well and so in terms of the the amount coming out i think i i mean as far as i remember there's rarely been more board games coming out than now and rarely have they been just of such consistently high quality it's just it's out just you know shocking how (laughs) high the bar continues to be for board games um so that in terms of having stuff to talk about there's definitely never a lack of stuff yeah um but you're right in terms of having to be picky. We have we have a sort of a lot of smaller designers come to us, people who are putting out their own stuff, because you know, again, it's never been easier for for people to start up a Kickstarter, make five, ten, fifteen grand, and bring out a game. And yeah. a lot of those games are, you know, great to excellent. But it's really hard to know that before they're out. And so often 
you find yourself either trying to preempt stuff and almost having to take a risk on some things yeah. and and obviously it helps if you you get it in and you play it and you're like okay you know we feel this is a really cool game that other people should know about i mean that's that's partly why the magazine exists yeah to, yeah yeah to help other people filter through it or if they don't have the time to go browsing through board game geek or reddit or yeah or whatever to pick up the magazine and use it as a quick reference of okay here's what's coming up here's what's come out here's what at least these guys think um so but we definitely have to be picky. Like I say, we, we have people get in touch and a lot of the time it's, it's you know, we we would love to cover a lot of the smaller folks and we definitely do. That's that's something I'm really keen to do is to cover the sort of one-person designers yeah. or studio, like well, you had, designers. Well, um, you, so you had Bez on the show, as we spoke about um, in the green room. Um, yes, yes. <laughs> the force of nature that was... Bez, who came on here recently, and she completely overtook the show. Yeah. Um, but um, I mean, did you speak in this? I mean, there's but then there's guys like say um, inside uh, inside the box board games that came out of seemingly nowhere with like Statecraft, and then were taking both Statecraft and Subterra won awards at the the kind of the UK Games Expo, which was really really kind of out of the blue compared to kind of what else was what else was out there. Yeah, exactly, and I think in the last uh, issue, the that would be the uh, maybe the August issue actually. I'm forgetting which issue, sorry, I start to lose <laughs> track at some point because the months become a blur. When you're the problem is when you're writing a magazine, you're obviously writing the magazine for a month that you're not yeah. in, so you start to lose track. So at the moment we're working on October, so I keep thinking it's October, but it's not. Uh, so it's the August issue, I be- <laughs> believe, uh, with the Starfinder cover and the Free Walking Dead promo card. If anybody wants to go uh, pick it up. Oh, sorry, what uh, was that? That was the the Free a, Walking a Dead free promo. Walking Dead promo card on the front of the the latest issue of Tabletop Gaming to to get the plug in while i'm here oh that's uh, it but it's the the magazine with the stuff under cover in there we have a review of subterra and we have a chat with uh, peter of inside yeah. the box and tim who's the designer of subterra um so it's definitely one of those things where that was really interesting and even before uk games expo we were keeping an eye on inside the box and thinking okay this looks really interesting yeah. you know subterra is a really interesting concept sort of pandemic meets the descent and again, Statecraft, we've got um, a review in the next magazine. Oh, right, okay. Uh, sort of a really interesting concept of this political card game where you are running, you know, you're trying to get voters on your side um, for sometimes it's a democratic uh, election, sometimes it's not. Um, but you're trying to shift your policies to attract different types of voters. So maybe you're trying to attract the unemployed and they're after one thing, or maybe you're trying to attract older voters or they're and they're after one thing and... And so they, inside the box, definitely have these really interesting concepts. I have personally found that the gameplay doesn't always pan out in those games. I was quite disappointed by Subterra, mm. uh, I'll admit. I really, really was looking forward to playing it. And just every time I played it, I just I just found it quite repetitive. It never really captured mm. the the atmosphere that I was looking for from a game like that. And, and actually, Statecraft was similar Um, again the review will be in the next magazine but statecraft has a similar thing where i really like the concept but in terms of the way the game functions it just didn't come together for me it didn't it a didn't capture the the theme correctly it didn't really get that atmosphere of a political race across in the right way and also it, it felt just kind of a bit inconsistent at points where a lot of the time it would be quite enjoyable and you'd be capturing voters and then you'd be sort of hindering your rivals with certain events and certain actions and then that stuff would either drop off or it would become overwhelming because the way the deck um functions is sort of it's very random and again inconsistent and so but inside the box that's not to you know not to fully criticize those games because i think there's definitely value in games that aim for really interesting and ambitious concepts even if they don't always pan out in terms of gameplay, uh, which is often the case with smaller designers, with smaller studios, um, who don't always have the same. You know, everybody's got to start somewhere, and I think starting yeah. with something that that aims high and ultimately falls a little bit short is better than something that's just you know another Cards Against Humanity's clone or yeah, exactly. just trying to be exploding kittens again. And, yeah, and we have that stuff. You know, we have people who Ten make those games too get in yeah. touch, and that's. Yeah. 
you know, some of them will be interesting and we'll take a look at them. We'll judge everything fairly. Uh, but I think it's definitely a more of a boon to have a game where you can look at it and go, okay, this is completely different to something that's out there. Maybe it doesn't all come together in the end, but at least they tried. And that's mm. exactly what we want to celebrate alongside the big blockbuster releases, you know, the the next Star Wars game, the next Twilight Imperium, the Fallout game, you know, all of this stuff that you know is going to be of a certain quality, you know, Fantasy Flight, even when they're not firing necessarily on all guns, always have a certain level of production. But yeah. there's definitely something to be said about the smaller smaller teams out there or smaller just lone people out there who are trying to do something great with yeah. what they have and and to look at that stuff on the same level as those big polished you know mega releases well we've got um we've got the grim forest coming out very i mean very soon um that i think that won the kind of the overall number one hotness at, at gen con that's james hudson's game and that just looks polished beyond belief i mean we'll see <clears throat> Sorry, we'll see how it plays. I mean, opinions are important. We had um, Rory Summers on recently, and he's a big advocate of Subterra. He loves it to pieces. Um, and you know, you got a different view. I played Terraforming Mars the other week, and I kind of walked away wondering what the hype was about, to be perfectly yeah, honest. Yeah, I mean, that, that's, you know, that's the reality of games, right? People yeah. have different opinions. It doesn't discredit one. It doesn't discredit the other. Yeah. I think, if again, it's better to have different opinions on one game rather than one game where everyone's just like, oh, this is, you know, if everyone considers something to be great, it, I think people become a little bit jaded and, you know, ultimately nothing nothing is for everyone. Or you it's end up don't have... taking a risk, don't you? I mean, you end up with a video mm. game industry kind of situation where the only guys exactly. that seem to be taking risks are this kind of maybe the small developers. So when a bigger developer comes along and does something different, everybody applauds it like it's the next best thing kind of ever. I've been hearing that about Hellblade recently. Mm. Um, and you'd think that nobody else had done a video game before the way that some people... I've kind of been talking about how it kind of tackles certain subjects, but I don't know if that's to do with the staleness. And I would rather have people taking the risks and going out there and saying, look, here's a game with dice that you can change the faces on the dice, or or here is a game that you can do potholing, or you know, here's a game that's all about you being three little pigs building your houses. So it's all it's all kind of interesting. But um yeah. I except apart from you when I play terraforming mars i put a big post on the facebook board game spotlight group and said terraforming mars i don't think it lived up to the hype <laughs> and then i just let the touch paper and step <laughs> back and i just had people saying your opinion is wrong and it's like well no it's my opinion it's kind of like um it's a decent game engine it works really well for what it does but I kind of, there's games, that I, I'm sure you're the same, there's games that you have played which have kind of wowed you, which you have sat there and went, this is fantastic. And I think Catacombs was one of them. Letters from Whitechapel for me was one of them. I don't know about you if there's been any games you've sat down and just went, this is the best. I mean, certainly recently, so A Feast for Odin, I was just sort of, I was blown away by, yeah. I think, just the, again, the ambition of it. I mean, uh, Rosenberg always delivers to a certain degree. You sort of know what you're getting uh, in a lot of cases, but it's just the, the scale of it and the the almanac that came with it that explained the historical accuracy <laughs> of yeah. every single bit and bob in the game. I, that was just one of those experiences where we played for, I think, three or three odd hours. And it was just this sort of, wow, you know, what, look at what board games can achieve that mm -hmm. maybe no other medium can you know there are other ways of simulating things there are there are video games that do it there are you know programs that do it there are books that give you an experience or films that give you an experience but that was one of those things where it definitely felt like this is one of the the few things where you almost couldn't feel it being recreated in any other medium because no. there was just something about it, the physical nature of it the the arrangement of you know things in your your storage hut as you're collecting them the the way you turn over board. in the way that same in the same way that pandemic legacy you know when i played that i played it with my partner and we played it we played the entire season over 
you know a couple a couple of nights you know, oh, right. we were okay. playing pandemic legacy for like four or five hours a night something like that you're a binge because, playing it <laughs> yeah because we we just were absolutely hooked on the legacy aspects this sort of the tearing up of cards mm. and the way that all progressed and i had a similar feeling about gloomhaven uh when i was playing gloomhaven where yeah how did you get on with gloomhaven night. yeah was I, it good i absolutely love it and we all sat right. down like every night for multiple weeks and would just play through one or two scenarios. We'd go back to the city, we'd have the encounters, yeah. you know, we'd level up our people, we'd unlock all these boxes. And again, it's it's one of those things that you just can't imagine working. It could be recreated in, you know, it could be made into an app, it could be made into these other things. It could potentially be a choose-your-own-adventure book, but yeah. it just wouldn't have the same level of sort of immersion, of involvement. And that's that's a big thing for me. I know that Again, people look for different things in board games, but that's something that I am definitely yeah that re- always draws me in is this just like i'm I am doing this, I am involved in this, I'm changing the way that this plays out um but gloomhaven i was I don't think it's perfect, there are definitely aspects that could be improved. I think the box is pretty awful. The organization <laughs> of the box is god awful, and it would be a much better game if it came with some decent trays, yeah uh, actually, the wasteland Express delivery service. Um, oh. I haven't I haven't played it yet, but we spent yesterday punching bits out of punch boards and putting Did them in you? the box. But my god, that box is very good. It is that one that's in of the trays. office, or is that your? Is that your no? One? That's a. I've brought it home with me because I'm actually off work this week, <sighs> taking a break after Gen Con. Uh, <laughs> so I'm hoping to crack a few, uh, crack through <clears throat> quite a few games of that uh, before I review it properly. Uh, but the the box alone is really sort of doing my number. It's you know it's well organized and yeah. again i read a designer diary uh, where they spoke about how they'd come up with the the use of the trays and the way everything's divided up and so on and it was to cut down on the setup time which yeah. they had said was i think they said it was about 20 minutes before and they'd got it down to about five minutes something like that but gloomhaven desperately needed something along those lines because gloomhaven the scenarios aren't particularly long yeah um especially because of the way the exhaustion mechanics work as you lose more and more cards from your hand and things like this they're sort of time limited by the amount that your characters can do but Mm -hmm. the setup became such a ball ache by searching through all this stuff oh i need to find one more prickly bush i need to find one more you know inox guard and it just became this real thing of it would take 10 15 20 minutes to break out the box and set up yeah but the scenarios weren't taking us that long and i feel like if this, that setup could have been reduced by just a decent organization in the box then it would become a game that you'd be able to play one scenario a night and obviously there's there's like a hundred scenarios in the box so you there's a lot to get through but if you could play one each night almost like a tv show then it would be a a much more accessible game but instead you've got a sideline at least 20 minutes to set up to pack everything out to remember where you were get your character out set up their stuff and and then add the time to actually play the game and yeah. so again weirdly enough that's one of those things that only relates to board games right is <laughs> yes, the setup yeah, time yeah. you don't have yeah. to do that with with video games or a film you just pop in a disc and you just crack yeah. open a book and it's one of those things with board games that can often be a negative. And with Gloomhaven, I feel that was one of my only knocks against it is if it had a decent organization system, it would be a much stronger game. But the the game itself, I think, is outstanding. I think it's a very impressive just sort of... It takes those legacy ideas from Pandemic, from Risk, from even Seafall, which I liked and nobody else did. Yeah, but you it, said that it, last it, it, um, <laughs> Yeah, and I stand by it. But um, it takes those ideas and it uses them in a new way that yeah. doesn't just, you know, ape off that work, but evolves it in a really clever sort of manner. And, it, you know, it also touches into the RPG side of stuff, which I enjoy a lot. Um, so, yeah, Gloomhaven I was very impressed by. Did you ever look at his previous game, Forge War? No, I haven't played Forge War. See, I mean, we joked. I mean, this is before kind of before you, um, Isaac, kind of hit us all with Gloomhaven. I think our third or fourth episode of the show was we actually apologised to Isaac on Twitter because we promised we were going to play Forge War, and Forge War is a lovely set of like mini games, and if you. 
you know, if you miss the Gloomhaven train and you want to start to see the obvious kind of the brilliance of Isaac Childress's mind, I would advise you go and pick it up. I mean, it's one of these games, I think, that it's little mini games. So there's a little mini game about collecting resources in the mine. Then there's a little mini game about kind of like buying weapons and getting, so you know, so people up a skill level to go on a quest. And then there's a little third mini game about actually going on a quest and kind of taking down people based on the equipment that you've got and your strength and stuff like that. And it's one of these games that, it again, it suffers from set up itis. I think it took about half an hour to, but it's very, very elegant and very, very beautiful to play kind of once it goes, got going. I personally will don't have and will not be getting a copy of Gloomhaven. Um, two reasons. The first reason is Colin's getting Gloomhaven. And uh, so we'll be we'll be playing that together. Uh, and the second reason is um, at the time it was either that or if it was City of Kings by Frank mm-hmm. West. And you know, I've got to look after my boy, basically. But uh, yeah, so um, even though he sent me that massive list of all the games that he he played, um, a qu- <laughs> we had a me- I've had a message from Chris Shepperson who said he met you at the UK Games Expo when you stopped to play a game of Package, which was his yes, little Kickstarter. Yes, yes, I really enjoyed Package. He was lovely. I also left my notebook at his stand, uh, right. I think on the maybe the Friday or the Saturday, and he was very kind and actually took it all the way home with him and then brought it back the very me- next morning and gave it to me because oh. uh, we because he had to leave immediately. So he ran off with my book, but it was my <laughs> own fault for leaving on his stand. So yes, Chris was very... Very kind, Mm. and I enjoyed Package very much. I thought it was a really interesting uh, game that used not a lot of stuff. There's sort of a couple of cubes and bits and bobs. Um, But yeah, it was a a really really interesting sort of micro game. But boy, there's a lot happening, a lot to sort of consider. Mm. Well, he says hello, so there you go. Uh, Hello, Chris. There you go. Well, and and, and, and he's, you know, yeah. So there you go. So it turns out he's he says you were a lovely bloke, but it turns out that he's quite a lovely bloke as well for going yes yeah going over and above to to kind of uh, to kind of get you. Um, you've been concentrating a lot aside on the website. I mean, obviously we were talking about kind of balancing up the 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 content that goes in the magazine with more stuff that goes on the website. So is that are you are you kind of a bit more? free-handed on the website with what you're putting on are, are you does it give you scope to be kind of covering more stuff on a day-to-day basis is it's kind of thing um because you seem to it seemed to have come it seemed to have gone from some place which was worthwhile having a look at for the big news stories to it seem you seem to have seriously be concentrating on packing it with a, a, an awful lot of content oh well thank you uh is i suppose it's it's two different styles of of coverage of of board games the magazine obviously has reviews it has these sort of longer form features and big interviews and there is there's definitely some of that on the the website as well we you know throw up exclusive interviews there and mm-hmm. and whatnot but i think the website it reflects the way that people use the internet a lot more which is the sort of smaller sort of in the moment stories yeah um because i th- i think that people at least you know our readers and people who enjoy board games they're more likely to sit down with a magazine they're more likely to to enjoy you know a big sort of six eight page interview about starfinder about bears versus babies in that that format but i don't think people necessarily use websites any website for that anymore they, there's longer form stuff out out there and we do do some of that on the website as well mm-hmm. um but it's definitely more of a in the moment you know this is being announced or here's what you should know about this so i think it helps to and because the magazine is naturally slower because of the way that magazines work and they need to be printed and and so on that makes sense to to almost split it that way and there is some crossover but we obviously want to you know people who buy the magazine don't want to see all of that stuff just up on the website no so we definitely hold quite a lot back for the magazine and uh-huh. then on the website, you get a lot of the stuff that you don't necessarily necessarily get in the magazine because by the time the magazine comes out, it's just not relevant anymore. You know, yeah. a lot of those stories are smaller stories that just you know if they're if they're important stories in the magazine, we'll cover them in more in depth ways. We'll speak to the designers, we'll speak to artists or publishers or studios, or we'll have a review. 
Whereas on the website, it will be more of a, okay, here's what you need to know now. Yeah. And then, you know, the rest, if you need to, if you want to know more, you know, come to the magazine, read this big feature on it. And so, and, and like I say, there is definitely crossover. Some of our reviews go up on the website um, once they've been in, in, once the magazine's been out a while. Cause again, there's no point in putting them up no, uh, immediately. Exactly. Cause yeah. you know, we, you know, you know, respect our readers most of all because they're the, they're the people that we, we depend yeah. upon. They're the people <laughs> that built us up to what we are today. You don't um, want somebody running past them while they're reading the magazine and going, mate, they gave this a three. Sorry. <laughs> he said he hated it. He's just like, <laughs> what? <laughs> well, at least on the internet, they can reply and tell me on Twitter that they disagree very <laughs> yeah, much with yeah. my opinions. Yes, and I'm sure they use that exact wording. I'd like to point you out, Mr. Jarvis, to an error I believe you made in your judgment to the following oh, date. you've been on the internet before, Richard. <laughs> <You've>... <laughs> yes, yes, I have, I've definitely. I think, you know, normal discourse and a kind of, um, <clears throat> I guess, regular value discussion um, is obviously the way the way forward on these on these things um mm. <clears throat> wow i need to get out more um what are you looking forward to i mean we're coming oh, up to i mean we have got let's face it sn it's the you know it's one of the biggest ones for europe um what are you what is going to create a little twinkle in the java side oh i was going to ask one more quick question though how did the cat Get on with the Gloomhaven box. Is it a yes or a oh, no? Oh, she loves the Gloomhaven box. Really? She is a, a big fan of Gloomhaven. <laughs> Actually, we were playing Mansions of Madness earlier today, and All right. that was a big hit with the cat. All right. In terms of if we're giving box scores from the cat, I think yeah. Mansions of Madness would probably be a 10. Gloomhaven really? might have been a little bit, just a little bit too tall. She, oh. can, she quite likes to sort of put her neck over so her head's mm. hanging out i don't know if that's specific to our cat or if that's just a cat thing mm, I don't know. um so she sort of and it's also gloomhaven is more of a rectangle whereas something like mansions of madness is a square and so when she curls up in a circle you know Perfect it fits it, yeah exactly so gloomhaven would probably be sort of an eight or nine uh, mm. but in terms of i think mansions of madness might be the best uh cat box we have so uh, is this going to become a regular feature? I think. Every I think time every time. Podcast, everything, we're just going to rate time. the latest boxes for cats. <laughs> Box cat. That's an entire podcast on itself. You could just rate <laughs> rate different things. No, I mean, um, I don't think. The, I think. Let's face it. The only thing you could use a um, fantasy flight box for would be if you had like a small, a small animal running back and forward, up and down the trench, thing. Um, I don't think you get much better than that. Because, no, I remember the cover art that we used for your last episode was your cat sitting in the Mex versus Minions box. Yes, that was a big hit. That was a big yeah, hit. That was a roomy box, though. Did you um, did you get all the way through to the end of the campaign? You know what? Yes, yeah. I really liked it. Really, really liked it. Yeah. I think that, that might have been one of my early editor's choices in the mm-hmm. magazine. Okay. But, yeah, Mex versus Minions is a, a fantastic... Really been... fantastic. Yeah, as someone who absolutely hated League of Legends when I played it, nah. I can't stand, and it, not necessarily the universe or the gameplay, and mm. I hate to say it, kind of the community, a lot of that stuff put me off. Yeah. But, um, in terms of Mix Mix versus Minions, the game, it's a just a fantastic game. Just a, yeah. Good. And I'd like to, I wonder what, if Riot will do more, because I I would definitely like to see them sort of build on that, not necessarily yeah. with an expansion either. No. I think they might have announced the expansion. I honestly can't remember. It was a. T- um, I think it was maybe a. It. Maybe they were hinting at some kind of toolkit mm. to allow you to create your own scenarios. Ah, uh, that might have been it. Which um, would be interesting. But oh. I'd love to see maybe just like a card game, something like that. Yeah. Which, speaking of which, like the Dark Souls card game, what's going on there? Like, come on. I I think well, if anyone read the magazine, they'll know that I really did not like Dark Souls the board game. <laughs> Despite being very excited for it and being very fond of Dark Souls, the video game, yeah, and and really, but I just, but I don't think it's a bad game. I think, I think what it is is it's a really good set of components, a really good set of ideas, mm. and sort of an underbaked set of rules. I feel if they were to revise the rules a little, maybe if some people were to house rule it, it would become perhaps a, a good game, maybe even a great game. But I think there's some just inherent flaws in the way the grinding works. And it just <laughs> isn't fun. The way it is now, it's not fun at all. I, but a card mm, game might solve that. Because 
that suggests that a card game would be quicker, might sort of streamline a lot of that stuff just because it's it's done with cards. It's not necessarily having to trudge your way through the same set of map tiles again and again and again. And Bloodborne the card game, uh, of course, Eric Lang's Bloodborne the card game, I really liked. I thought that was that was brilliant. And so I'm sort of questioning the need for a Dark Souls card game at all. Yeah. Um, and then of course they've got Resident Evil going on as well, so they're... Do you know what? There's only one thing that I am not too sure about, which is the way that you can get it, which is going through the backer kit, and also time, putting an extreme kind of time on it. I think the date... There is a different way to get it. You can pre-order, pre-order it off the site, I think, directly. Right, okay. You don't have to go through the backer kit. I think it's 30 quid, but they're only doing that for a couple of weeks. It might, <laughs> yeah. might have shot by now. Yeah, I think but... so. I think it was until the... Yeah, so they're not they're not days ago. kickstarting it, but I think if you back the board game, you can get it through there. But you can also just buy it directly off their site. But hey, you know, maybe wait and see if it's any good mm. before buying mm. it. That would be my advice. I like. See, I'm gonna I'm gonna go and say I like the Dark Souls board game, but I liked playing it in single player more than I like playing it in multiplayer. I I think that would probably help. It would probably. I think the single player rules cut they naturally introduce a lot of the stuff that needs to cut down that grind. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, you do start off, I mean, instantly it says, you know, it's a quick aside, it says, like, if you start with more than one player, if you start with one, more than one player, put no souls in the yeah, pot. Exactly. <laughs> if you start off with just one player, put 27 souls in the thing, and you're just like, right, okay, well, that makes already a huge kind of difference. So it does kind of cut down on the grade. Yeah. But and you're I... not having to split them between people and be like, no. well, you can level up and use maybe this weapon if we <laughs> get can... one by randomly drawing cards out of the treasure deck, maybe. I oh, feel wait, like... we spent all our souls on drawing treasure cards. Guess we can't level up and use any of these items. Never mind. Okay, I think I'm taking you down to a position of not like, this is angry, Matt. I'm not sure I've No, that, but that's what I mean. Kind of like, I feel like if they, tweak, Matt. if they tweaked those rules, yeah. if they had changed those rules, it could be a good game to a great game. I think the ideas in there, the combat is great. The boss yes. fights are fantastic. Yes. The, mod- the models and the miniatures are great. There's generally, there's a lot of good ideas in there, but I feel they're just very poorly executed. Yeah. But again, you know, as as far as it goes with the, Dark Souls card game, it might be great. Bloodborne, the card game, was real good. And that was surprising for even me. You know, it's an Eric Lang game. It's based on a video game. You know, sort of different ends of the spectrum there. But that was really, really good. But I would probably just say don't pre-order it, maybe. Just wait and then read, like, Tabletop or <laughs> wherever your, just, just, you know, yeah. review outlet of choices. You know, I have to say other... That's why they exist. Other... Other websites and magazines are available. Oh, course, Terms course, and conditions yeah. on request. There's <laughs> people because you're going to start saying, "Oh, I store my stuff in Calac shelving," and then we're all back to a whole like. Can <laughs> well, I now you time. mention it? Don't even, Matt. Come on. I, just... I don't actually use. I don't use Calax. I'm probably Jeez. one of the few people that doesn't. I store them under. I've got a bed that lifts up, so that's how yes, we naturally limit the board game collection is yes. by storing it under a bed. Although that's now that rule has been broken because we I was started storing stuff that. above the the bookcase <laughs> and next to the bookcase and in a beautiful cranny oh, around the house. I was uh, waiting so for that. Mechs versus Minions is now living on top of the bookcase because Jesus Christ, that box is massive. That's like you know what I mean. It's like see those adverts you see on film four in the morning if you've accidentally been watching a film the night before, and then you turn the telly on before you know just I'll put the telly on and you get these like. I've got abs, abs, <laughs> kind of like the abs adverts, perfect abs. I'm just expecting one day just to see a guy going, coming in, I'm from Riot Games, I do mechs and minions, I do 15 stomach crunches a day with my mechs and minions box, and look at these, I'm ripped, and it's just a guy <laughs> doing exercises using the mechs versus minions box, because I even like <laughs> said to my like 11-year-old son, oh, here, we're going to be playing this, and we did, we played it for like hours and had the best time. But I gave him the box and he like constantly like put it in his arms and then fell flat horizontally on his back <laughs> because he kind of upended him, which was, you know, I had to be concerned as a father, but also I, I did laugh a lot. That's fair enough. It is. I think that's the same thing, really. <laughs> is there There's anything? There's only one you... way to teach them. <laughs> well, that's by watching, you know, letting them fall and then just picking them up when they realise that they shouldn't be handling board games which are <laughs> too, too big. Um... No, is there anything that you're looking forward to kind of going forward? Because we said we said Essen and then we sidetracked and then we talked Dark Souls. But Essen with Essen coming up, is there anything that you're particularly excited about? 
Uh, I mean, I don't, I don't think it's been confirmed for Essen yet, but I'd, I'd be very surprised if it's not out there. Uh, Pandemic Legacy season two, obviously, mm-hmm. uh, having chatted about how sort of obsessed we were with the first one, I just to see what Rob and Matt have done. I mean, where, where can you go really? Because the first one was built on Pandemic and used that in a really clever way, but here they're sort of starting from scratch again. Mm-hmm. I'm just wondering how they'll, how they'll build that up. And of course, Rob. Uh, having done Seafall, this seems to have some elements of Seafall, and it seems to have some elements of Pandemic Iberia, which I think is a like a fantastic addition of Pandemic. It's a really, really good yeah. sort of spin on Pandemic. It's very Pandemic-like, but it introduces um, sort of more of a naval movement system and sort of moving between ports and things like this. And so I'm wondering how much of that will come into Season 2, and just, again, like how far they can push it. I mean, it's been a, a couple of years now since Season 1, and like I say, there's been since then. There's been so many legacy games. There's been things like Gloomhaven. There's obviously Charterstone coming up, which Ooh, I'm yes. really interested in because I think Scythe is just incredible. Um, so I'm interested to see what Jamie Stegmaier do, does. But it's with been that. delayed. Yes, yeah, it has. Yeah, which is a bit yeah due to sticky paper of all things. <laughs> so <laughs> board games, sorry. <laughs> um, no, yes, but you were saying Charterstone, other legacy yes. games. Yeah, um, so just seeing if they've taken in sort of inspiration from people who have built on what they did with season one, or or whether they had ideas for season one that maybe they weren't confident enough in at the time because they didn't know. Obviously, they'd done Risk Legacy, but they weren't sure how it would pan out with season one. So maybe they're going a little bit sort of more wild now. But it's just, I mean, that's what the game's built around, right? Is the the element of surprise, the element of of seeing what comes up next and opening that next box and peeling that next sticker off and <laughs> destroying those cards and sobbing in a corner because it's all gone and you can't ever replace it. Uh, so that that is very exciting. Are you are you going to take kind of like the editor's kind of... Um, are you going to be pulling rank when it comes to deciding who's reviewing Pandemic Legacy Season 2? Well, we try and go with, we've actually got um, a number of new reviewers joining us uh, All right, okay. quite soon, um, sort of regular contributors to the magazine who you'll start seeing pop up more and more, mm-hmm. um, also focusing more more on stuff like RPG reviews and things like that, trying yeah. to, to get that stuff rolling more. Um, but in terms of all reviews, you know, we try and give them to people who, who know what they're on about, hopefully, and who, who are able to comment. And I'd like to think that, you know... I- <laughs> The pandemic, I'd probably say, is maybe, if not my favourite game, it's definitely right up there. So, <clears throat> so Mr. Jarvis, you are saying, case. yeah, I'm hearing. Well, of course, I don't have rank. to make a case to anyone because I'm the editor and I can just, you know, be an arse and be like, no, I... I'm doing it. But, but yeah, um, you know, we'll see what happens. But yes, I am definitely <laughs> we'll hoping that I'm the right happens. person for the job at the time. <laughs> oh dear, we're gonna have. <laughs> it's gonna be. We're gonna run the one man, one vote system. I'm the man. Exactly. I've got the vote. <laughs> kind of thing. Here's my vote. Oh, look! It's. Can you believe that? It's me. I'm absolutely so shocked. Here, where I'll just just take this, kind of kind of away. <laughs> it's just yeah. I can I can imagine. I'll be looking out for the to the review when it kind of hits. Is there anything else you're kind of looking forward to? So I've mentioned it a couple of times. But Twilight Imperium. I've never yes. played Twilight Imperium. Uh, and I feel like it is a big, both in terms of size and also influence, a big hole because I, it's sort of in my knowledge, in my experience, because I, I absolutely love Eclipse mm. um, and I absolutely love Diplomacy and Twilight Imperium has always seemed sort of the, the ma- a sort of a mashup between those two in some ways and also the, its own weird thing in a lot of ways. Um, and funnily enough, when I was at UK Games Expo, there was a copy of a third edition um, on one of the, sort of the the seller stands, uh, and I looked at it a number of times and thought, mm, "Should I go for it?" And really ummed and ahed for probably the four or five days I was there, um, and eventually didn't didn't go for it just because there was a lot there was a lot to cover from the show and there was a lot obviously <laughs> coming up. Um, but this is this is the perfect excuse I think to to get a copy of that and, and whether I'm reviewing it or not, just just sort of experience it. Because from what I understand, it is a hell of an experience. Yeah, I've heard. Um, so I'm very, 
I'm very curious about that. But I would like to go back to third edition um, at some point and maybe see some of the changes if they seem seem significant. I'm not sure they seem that significant from from sort of reading what Fantasy Flight's put out. It seems a little bit more streamlined, but I mean, they used to say third edition had an estimated playtime of about three to four hours, and from what I understand, it was about no. three hours per person. Yeah, uh, is more accurate. So I'm wondering. They now say it's four to eight hours, I think, for fourth edition. So if that's if that's accurate, if they finally sort of nailed that, that could be. That's still obviously a hell of a long time, but yeah, so they, um, it seems like it's been significantly sort of boiled down from sort of the the monster it used to be. But like I say, as someone who who likes diplomacy, diplomacy is notoriously long, uh, and there's a lot of sort of backstabbing and, and <laughs> chatting and so on. So that's not necessarily an uh, intimidating thing no. uh, but I'm very curious to, to see what all the fuss is about I suppose yeah and I think the funniest thing about it is the fact that um, Andy Lewis from Polyhedron Collider was uh, he was talking about playing Twilight Imperium 3 only to find out that the 4th edition had been announced so he was yeah, same, <laughs> exactly the same position as me <laughs> <laughs> everybody takes interest in well, I say everybody. Everybody already loved it, didn't they? We were sort yeah. of on the, the back foot. Yeah. There's a load of people looking at this podcast going like, Oh, we knew before you and of course you <laughs> did. Like <laughs> like yes. There'll be know, a petition on kind of like change.org saying get rid of Matt Jarvis because he hadn't been playing Twilight Imperium. What does he know about board games? Dag uh, they'll be too busy trying to get IKEA to make a board game table. <laughs> I've seen a there's a gaming table thing going about yeah, recently. Yeah. I've seen that kind of kicking about, and uh, what I've also seen, Dized as well. This kind of learn the rules app thing, which I've seen that kind of kicking about as well. Which seems yes, to be like yeah, a we actually app. have a in the October issue. We will have right. a an interview with Dized. Oh, okay. About I, I what they're doing. It's really interesting. Um, yeah. I spoke to them at UK Games Expo. I think it's a really, it's a really good thing it could be a really good thing um depending on how they they do it they're essentially trying to to teach you as you go along and to get rid of that because it, it can be the case you know you crack open a game and then there's like half an hour to an hour of learning the game um and they're trying to get rid of that using an app which is like a noble deed whether whether it works out um we'll see um, yeah but it's it sounds interesting and it sounds and it sounds i asked them about um because obviously there were you know, there are plenty of YouTube videos out there that teach you as you go along that are all, you know, very excellent. Um, but um, it sounds like they're trying to take advantage of, of having like an app and things like that. So we'll see, you know, that's not, you know, yeah. it could turn out to just be sort of a, a mess of of how it works because you're having to tap on a thing between each tiny little adjustment or move and some things might not be as clear as they are in a rule book. But it's interesting to see people using that stuff, given the rise of companion apps and and these other sort of uh, technology enhanced aspects of board gaming. Yeah, so. yeah, I think they're um, Mike Barnes is he'll be on the show around about the beginning of next month as well. So I shall ask him and see what he says. But we shall find we shall find out. Um, for people that I've listened tonight and want to keep an eye on what you're up to and what you're doing to see if you're actually genuinely into board games if you haven't really played Twilight Imperium 3rd Edition. I'll openly admit that I have not. <laughs> <laughs> um, where can they find you on the internet, Mr. Matt Jarvis? So they can find, well, they can find the magazine, which will probably interest them a lot more than me. <laughs> uh, they can find the magazine, uh, you can find at tabletopgaming.co.uk. Yes, uh, and then there's obviously all the news on there. That's where you can subscribe to the magazine or you can pick up individual copies. We're also in shops sort of around the world. Uh, so in the UK, you can find us in places like WH Smith or Hobby Stores. You know, um, Sainsbury's at the moment is one of the Starfinder issue and so on. So you should be able to find us in there. Um, we're on Facebook. Facebook is just dot com slash tabletop gaming magazine. Uh, and then Twitter is slash tabletop or at tabletop mag. But if you go to the website, it's all there. Tabletopgaming.co.uk. Yeah. That will lead you to where you need to go. But I mean, if and if people enjoy the mag, they just get in touch. Like we'd love to hear from readers. We hear from someone sent me a handwritten letter the other day. I was blown what? away with a hand drawn diplomacy map of all things. Really? Uh, 
because we had reviewed Diplomacy in the magazine, uh, the new edition. Yeah. Um, the 2017 edition. Um, but, and they'd obviously read this review and, and just decided to get in touch on a whim and sort of tell us about this alternate map that oh. I think some, someone else had created. They hadn't created it, but they were oh. letting us know. But I mean, that stuff is fantastic. Like we, we would try and respond to every, every email, every, that letter I couldn't respond to because they didn't leave an address, but I would have. You know, I would have sent a carrier pigeon if someone sent one to me first. Uh, don't Maybe they just get pigeons. the next. Don't note. send me carrier pigeons, please. Um, um, remember, carrier pigeons, really bright white ones as well. Uh, Matt really likes the grey ones too. So does his cat, probably. Oh um, God, yeah, yeah. In a zombie apocalypse, okay, you are mm. running down the street. You manage to escape into an alley, into the back door of a place. And it turns out to be a huge board game emporium. Okay? Mm -hmm. Time is no object. Money is no object. They have any game you want. What three games, knowing that you're about to go out into the front door with the zombie horde thinking of survival, what three board games do you take with you? Any so I have to use have. them for survival. The the, the or you can just survival. You could be survival, or you could just take them along because they're damn good fun. And you might end up meeting, you might end up meeting between two to nine people, <laughs> and also <laughs> tables are available everywhere, so you don't have to worry about table space. What do you take in the zombie apocalypse, Mister Matt Jarvis? But you know what? Maybe picking up a copy of Twilight Imperium. <laughs> but then you could you could split the box, use it as sort of body armor because it's probably okay. the biggest one of the biggest boxes around, right? Okay. So you could use that as body armor, right? Sort of get them away. <clears throat> and then I'm trying to think what you could use as a weapon. You need something sort of. Well, you don't even have to use it as a weapon. You can say that. Or you just say two games you'd like to take with you to play, or three oh, do... games you like. Yeah. Ah, but that that you know depends on me surviving the zombies. I'm not sure that's a <laughs> so practical. <laughs> Second well, game, Mr. Jarvis got well, hurry you, they're banging on the door. Well that's the thing, like if I get eaten, it's not like I can be like, Well, at least I tried to play, you know, Twilight Imperium and I went out that way. <laughs> it's not like I'm gonna be like, Oh Second God. game got to press you. They're banging oh, through God. the door, come on quickly. Do you know maybe Tazolkin, is it I don't know. Yes, there you go. Right? Yeah, yep. you could use yep. the gears as weapons. <laughs> Okay. He's taking an entire walk sure dead card, slant on this. I'm sure that cardboard gears would do a lot against, you know, rotting flesh and bone. But Well, you know, they're very kind of off-the-bone kind of zombies, mm. so you could, they would probably just fall apart if you touch them. Final game. Oh, God. They've, uh, they've smashed the glass. Is this assuming that I don't have any board games at home, that they've all been eaten by zombies? They've, you, these, you can get any board game you want. You can Maybe take I'd... one. Maybe I'd just take Pandemic. I'd yes. just grab Pandemic, because then if I meet anyone, I can be like, let me explain to you what's going on. And I, we could use it to plan, assuming that we then had the ability uh. to fly between countries and also <laughs> set up medical centres and quarantines and so on. Yeah. You've actually but, ro you've role-played this to the next level. But... Yes. Ah, <laughs> oh, dear. And um, on that note, <laughs> um, listen, thank you for coming on. Thank you very much for having me. It's been a, a pleasure again. And hopefully people people do, don't believe anything I've said here. Just re read the magazine. Don't don't listen to me. This <laughs> is one better in words because I can delete all the stupid things <laughs> that I'm about to say. Listen, if I deleted all break. the stupid things I said, there'd only be like about 15 episodes of this podcast <laughs> and the rest of it would just be other people talking to silence, pretty much. Um, this has been a pleasure as always to have you on. Um, as is, As... Matt has rightly said if you want to go and read the words as opposed to any other method, then we'll put links in the show notes so we've got notes to show. Um, Tabletop Gaming Magazine, we show, as I say, they'll be there for you to have a look through. Um, no, listen, just thank you for coming on. It's um, It's been good to catch up. Um, thank you. Really glad. Anytime. Yeah, I'm good to see the, the magazine is doing really, really, really well and the online side seems to be doing well too yes keep your eyes peeled we will have some exciting stuff in store very soon that is all i can say but <laughs> needless to say there's a lot of exciting stuff happening <laughs> that's gives me nothing jarvis 
I know. Absolutely. This is why I work stitch, in journalism. Stitch, stitch. And here's some exciting news that I'm not going to tell you. It's like Henry exactly. Jasper. Buy the magazine. Buy games. the magazine if you want the uh, the news. <laughs> the news okay. You can go on the website. It's free on the website. The news is free. The news is free. Everything else, no. The subscription will cost you. Um, you can subscribe online um, to the magazine as well. You definitely can, yeah, mention, around the world that. as well. No well, matter where go. you are, no excuse. And in digital. Fantastic. We're not sponsored by Tabletop Gaming Magazine, I need to point that out. Um, <laughs> but there are only two more things to do. And the first thing is to remember that we are many things. But we're not wizards. Are we wizards? No. no. Absolutely. Well, not. most of the time, I don't know. <laughs> I've been known to dabble. <laughs> Don't ruin what has been an absolutely wonderful um, time this evening by even going near the W word. Um, <clears throat> and the second thing is to, well, if you want to catch up and remember what we are up to or remember what we're up to, find out what we're up to, follow us, look after us, search us out on the Googles. Go to Google's, search We're Not Wizards, you will find us on YouTube, you'll find us on Acast, you'll find us on Stitcher, you'll find us on Twitter, you'll find us on Instagram, you'll find us on Facebook, you'll find us hanging about various kind of board game type groups on Facebook now, kind of occasionally causing controversy, but always with a slight wink in our eye, just to say, haha, let's not take the internet too seriously. If you like what you've listened to tonight, and we do thank everybody that has actually been leaving us reviews, because it really does help us get out there. Um, if you do like what you've heard, as we say, jump on Apple Podcasts and drop us a rating, drop us a review. If you are going to give us a review, remember, don't give us a 10, because that makes us big-headed. Don't give us a 1, because that makes us cry. Give us a 5, because that is in the middle. It is average. And we are very average. But as I say, the person that's not been average tonight is the wonderful, fantastic man of paper and words, Mr. Matt Jarvis. So, thank you again, Matt. Thank you, Richard. It is time to say goodbye. So, as I say, it's a goodbye from Matt. Goodbye. And it's a goodbye from me. Remember, stay safe. Roll sixes. Um... I'm not going to plug it anymore because we've plugged it enough. <laughs> um, but keep an eye out. Essen's coming along. Let's see what's going to happen with Essen. Uh, stay tuned to us for some other interviews coming up, including Mr. DC from Steamforge Games is going to talk about Dark Souls. We've also got John Gilmore's going to be coming on. We've got James Hudson's going to be coming on. We've got Mike Barnes from Diced. We've got Mark McKinnon from Wreck and Ruin fame. He's coming back on again, plus a few more. We will be putting news of that on the website. But until the next time, thank you for listening. Big hugs and kisses. And goodbye. <laughs>